Okay, picking up where we left off before fall break, should be on page 1245. <clears throat> In Act 1, Scene 2, Hamlet has been addressed by King Claudius and then his mother, Queen Gertrude. And Gertrude brings up that Hamlet's behavior seems a little odd, or she implies that Hamlet's behavior seems a little odd because he is still in mourning for his father, who's been dead, we're going to find out um, a little bit later, somewhere between two and four months. All right. She says, um, I'm going to back up a little bit, beginning around line 70. Do not forever with thy veiled lid seek for thy noble father in the dust. Thou knowest his common. All that lives must die, passing through nature to eternity. Okay? So, she's just issued what is called a commonplace term or um, man, I still cannot think of that word. Starts with a P. Like a trite aphorism. It's not applauded. Um, and Hamlet says, I, tis common. That is, you're right. Everything that lives must die. Okay, but notice what your footnote says. I, common. It is common, but it hurts nevertheless. Possibly a reference to the commonplace quality of the king's remark. In other words, just because you said everything that lives must die doesn't make it any easier to accept. Doesn't make it any easier to go on, you know, living in the midst of the loss that he's experienced. Queen, if it be, that is, if it is common, if it is ordinary, if it is every day, essentially, why seems it so particular with thee? That is, why does death seem to be affecting you so particularly? Now, bear in mind, it's his father who died sometime within the last two to four months. Okay? His father was what to Gertrude? He was her husband. Shouldn't, be, shouldn't it be a little particular with her also? That is, should Hamlet be the only one mourning? No, she should be mourning also. Hamlet, seems, madam? Nay, it is. I know not seems. So Hamlet's picking up on that Subjunctive verb. Subjunctive indicates it's a condition contrary to fact. All right? So he says, seems? No. Not seems. Tis not alone my inky cloak, good mother. And that's kind of, you know, he's being a little bit sarcastic there nor customary suits of solemn black, nor windy suspiration of force of breath, no, nor the fruitful river in the eye, nor the dejected behavior of the visage, together with all forms, mood, shapes of grief that can denote me truly. So everything he's just described are customary or common attributes of mourning. Inky cloak, he's wearing black, right? You don't wear bright, flowery or white clothing to a funeral. You wear black. Okay? Nor windy suspiration of forced breath, constant sighing. All right? Nor the fruitful river in the eye, frequent tears. Nor the dejected behavior of the visage, always walking around, looking like he's about to burst into tears. 
together with all forms, moods, shapes of grief. That is, all forms of grief, all moods of grief, all shapes of grief. So take grief and expand it and include everything that you can within it. He says all those things together cannot denote me truly. What's the difference between a denotation and a connotation? Denotation is the literal dictionary definition. Okay? So, if a if you know what a smurf is, if a smurf walks into the room and says, I'm blue today, what does that mean? Denotation wise. Well, smurfs are literally blue. Old TV comics, whatever that my kids watch. Connotation, however, is what? If someone says, Yeah, I'm kind of blue today, what's it mean? Sad. They're a little down, they're sad. Something's weighing on them, okay? He says these things, all these descriptions that he's given, they can't denote me truly. No, these indeed seem. Why? Because they're all things you can put on. <coughs> they're all things you can act out. Anybody can wear black. Anybody can look sad. Anybody can, <sighs> anybody can make themselves cry. He says, for there are actions that a man might play. Okay? It's another theme of this play. Play at it. Pretending. Okay? Not pretending like two little kids pretending to play some kind of game, but in kind of the adult world, pretending to be something one is not. These indeed seem, for they are actions that a man might play. But I have that within, I have that within which passeth show. These, these but the trappings and the suits of woe. Now, he has just told the king and queen and anybody else on the stage who can hear and the audience what's going on inside in Hamlet. Internally, how is Hamlet? Is he well? Is he of sound mind? Is he just, you know, at the top of the world? Everything is going wonderfully for him? No. He says, I have that within which passeth show. It goes beyond what you see. He says, what you see, these are but the trappings, the, the the outward ornamentation in the suits of woe. So the king now addresses him. Tis sweet and commendable in your nature, Hamlet, to give these morning duties to your father. In other words, well done. This is how a son should behave. But those are only the first two lines. But you must know your father lost the father. That father lost, lost his. And the survivor bound in filial, ob filial obligation for some term to do obsequious sorrow. That is, it is fitting and right and proper <coughs> to mourn the dead for a term, a period of time, but to persevere in obstinate condolement is a course of one, impious stubbornness impious it goes against god it goes against religion okay two tis unmanly grief hamlet you're acting like a woman is what claudius is saying okay three it shows a will most incorrect to heaven why because St. Paul says, you know, be thankful in all things. Take the good with the bad, etc. Job says, the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord, kind of a thing. Okay? 
uh, will most sin correct to heaven? That was three, I believe. Wait. <laughs> Stubbornness, grief, will, yeah. Four, a heart unfortified. That is, he's showing a lack of courage. Five, a mind impatient. That is, unwilling to suffer. A mind that wants things to happen immediately. Six, an understanding simple and unschooled. Why simple and unschooled? Your little gloss down at the bottom. Ninety. Well, it doesn't have a gloss, but it has a little dot over it. I don't know why. Oh, sorry, I was misreading. Um, a mind simple and unschooled. Unschooled how? Because it's going against, this is common. This happens all the time. Your mind should be prepared for this, in other words. Okay? For what we know must be and is as common as any of the most vulgar thing to sense. Why should we in our peevish opposition take it to heart? Peevish opposition. Peevish kind of means spoiled brat-like. You're not getting your way, so you're going to stomp off kind of a thing. Okay? So he's saying, by your still mourning your father, you're doing all of these things, Hamlet. Tis a fault to heaven, a fault against the dead, a fault to nature, to reason most absurd. Why? Because what does reason say? Everything dies, period. Suck it up, buttercup. Whose common theme is death of fathers and who still, still there means always, constantly, hath cried. From the first course till he that died today. Course there is our modern English corpse. From the first course till he that died today. This must be so. So Claudius is kind of telling us. If we take Claudius's words at face value. What is his attitude towards death? I, whether death in general or death in particular, like somebody he knew. The French have a phrase. C'est la vie. That's life. That's what happens. You live, you die. Period. Go on. Move on. Get over it. Right? What was the dead king to Claudius? His brother. Okay? All three of these should be mourning similarly. Son for father, wife for husband, brother for brother. So we pray you throw to earth this unprevailing woe. Throw to earth means bury it. Bury your grief, Hamlet. This unprevailing woe. And think of us. He's using the royal we. Think of us. As a father. Let me be your father. Not your stepfather. Not your uncle slash stepfather. But let me replace Hamlet Sr.'s place. For let the world take note. You are the most immediate to our throne. And with no less nobility of love than that which dear father bears his son. Do I impart towards you. What does he mean you are the most immediate to our throne? You're next in line. To You're next in line Hamlet. See, there's a problem with his saying that, however. That's, a, that's an example of dramatic irony. Hamlet was most immediate to the throne also when? When his father, when his father was still alive. Hamlet was next in line. Law primogenitor. Father, eldest son, kind of a thing. Uh, and what happened? Just like the warlike form of Denmark usurped the time of night, 12 to 1 a.m., you know, when the ghost appears. 
Claudius usurped the throne. Hamlet Jr. should be king. Okay? So he says, don't go back to school. I don't want you going back to Wittenberg. I, we want you to stay here with us. So we're told Hamlet is a student at Wittenberg University. Right? He says, stay here, queen. Let not thy mother lose her prayers, Hamlet. I pray thee, stay with us. Go not to Wittenberg. I shall in all my best obey you, madam. Notice, he replies to his mother, but not to Claudius. So the king says, good, that's great. Okay? Be as ourself in Denmark. That means be Hamlet like the king when you're in Denmark. It's kind of elevating Hamlet, giving him a lot of power, authority, etc. So, da, 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 da. Um, he has cannons, you know, shot off and stuff, and everybody leaves but Hamlet. So we have the first, so little, the first soliloquy. Bear in mind, a soliloquy is when an actor is alone on the stage. No one else. And the actor reveals the character's mind. The actor reveals what the character is internally thinking, believing, etc. So when Hamlet delivers this speech, this is just like Hamlet thinking out loud. What is this next speech all about? Goes from lines 129 to 158 or so. Oh, that this too, too sullied flesh would melt, thaw, and resolve itself into a dew. Now, the term sullied there in the first folio, if I remember correctly, the first folio version has solid. Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt, thaw, and resolve itself into a new. What's the difference between sullied and solid? I mean, they both make sense. Solid means what? It's hard. It's real flesh. Sullied means what? Mm. Larry? Mm. Close, dirtied, fouled, stained. See, this is the more obvious reading. Why? Because he says that it would melt, thaw, and resolve. That's what you do with solids. If it's a like solid fat, you melt it and dissolve it. Okay. Sullied, however, is the harder reading, and according to some principles of what's called textual criticism, is probably what Shakespeare initially or primarily intended. Oh, that this too, too sullied, dirtied, foul, tainted flesh would melt thought and resolve itself into a dew. Because what happens if, this is not purifying water, this is just tap water. What happens if I take this water and boil it and put a cap on it with a tube that goes like this and the tube empties into another bottle or something? What kind of water would I get from this into here? But I know? Purified. It would have no imperfections. It would have been melted, thawed, and resolved. The dew would be pure. He's saying, oh, that this would melt, thaw, and be resolved into a dew, be purified, be refined, be made perfect. Or, so that's the first option, or that the everlasting had not fixed his canon against self-slaughter. What self-slaughter? It's literally the English translation for suicide, self-murder. So Hamlet's first soliloquy 
introduces the idea of suicide. But does so how? God's against it. Oh God, God, how weary still, flat, and unprofitable seem to me all the uses of this world. All the uses, all the pleasures, all the joys, all the stuff, he says, of this world is what? Meaningless. Fiat, fi. Tis an unweeded garden that grows to seed. Notice, it is a garden, but now the garden has become what? Full of weeds. Things rank and gross in nature possess it merely. All right. Do you th what do you think Hamlet means by things rank and gross in nature? See, if I were directing this, I would direct Hamlet, the character, the actor playing Hamlet, that when you say those lines, Kind of point to where Clydes and Gertrude just left. That's what he's talking about. They possess this world. Okay? How do I know? That it should come to this, but too much dead. Nay, not so much. Not too. So excellent a king that was to this, where Clydes was standing, Hyperion to a center. Hyperion, sun god, to a, think of that, you know, when I had the great chain of being drawn up here, you have the animal realm, the human realm, the angelic realm. A center is a mixture of the animal and the human, the beastly and the human. It's lower than human. My father, he says, was like the sun god. Claudius is lower than human. So loving to my mother that he might not beteem the winds of heaven, visit her face too roughly. He would ask the winds, don't blow on my mother's face too, too strongly. He doesn't want her to get windburn. He doesn't want her hair, didn't want her hair to get blown out of order. Heaven and earth must ever, she would hang on him as if increase of appetite had grown by what it fed on. In other words, she was like Helena after Demetrius. She, Gertrude, okay, to Hamlet Sr. She looked for everything from him. And yet, within a month, oh, let me not think on it. Why not? Why let me not think on it? What does thinking about it do to Hamlet? Drives him crazy. Frailty thy name is woman. A little month or ere those shoes were old with which she followed my poor, poor father's body. She says, line 150, a beast that wants, that is lax, discourse of reason would have mourned longer. A dog, a cat, a cow. <laughs> Would have mourned for its mate longer than my mother did for my father. Married with my uncle. My father's brother, but no more like my father than I to Hercules. Within a month. You know, there he's suggesting it hasn't even been a month. Ere yet the salt of most unrighteous tears had left the, left the flushing in her galled eyes. She married before she even stopped crying. He says, she married. Oh, most wicked speed to post with such dexterity to incestuous sheets. It was like she did gymnastics to get into bed with his uncle. Okay, so what's bothering Hamlet? Is it that his father is dead? That's partially it. What else? His mom didn't wait long enough. His mom didn't wait. Seemingly, is what Hamlet is suggesting. Okay? And Freud had a lot of fun with this play. I mean, Freud saw a lot of Oedipus kind of issues in the play. It is not, nor it cannot come to good. In other words, Hamlet's saying, 
There's something wrong here. But break my heart, for I must hold my tongue. So, because I can't talk about it, Hamlet says, I've got to bottle it up. And what's it going to cause? It's going to cause his heart to break. Okay? So Horatio comes in. And Hamlet's like, what are you doing? Why, why are you here? You should be in Wittenberg. He says, um, a truant disposition. That is, I'm just taking my time to get back. He says, no, no, no. I know why you're here. I, I came to see your father's funeral. More like to see my mother's wedding. Well, yeah, that too. Okay. So they keep going on back and forth. Horatio says he saw the king once. Hamlet shall not look upon him again, 187 or so. I think I saw him last night. Who? The king, your father. The king, my father. Calm down. Let me explain. So Horatio relates the story. All right. He says, we tried to talk to it. It wouldn't say anything. It left off. And you're keeping watch again tonight? Yes, we are. Hamlet says, I will come. All right? So, after they all, before they all leave, Hamlet says, page 1250 to 40 or so, if it assume my noble father's person, I'll speak to it, though hell itself itself should gape and bid me hold my peace. Okay? Don't tell anyone, Hamlet says. They say, all right. Everybody leaves but Hamlet. Second soliloquy. It's just a short one. Soliloquies don't have to be long speeches. Hamlet. My father's spirit in arms, all is not well. I doubt, meaning I expect, some foul play, excuse me, some foul play. So, till then, till the night come, till then, um, sit still my soul. Why? Because his soul is bubbling. His soul is aroused. His soul is disturbed. And he's kind of going, down, boy, down. Foul deeds will rise, so all the earth overwhelm them to men's eyes. Okay? Scene three. We're in Polonius' house. In Laertes, Polonius' son, is talking with Ophelia, Polonius' daughter, Laertes' sister. Okay? And they talk about Hamlet. Okay, Hamlet is the prince, right? Future king of Denmark. And Laertes gives her romantic advice, beginning lines five and following. For Hamlet and the trifling of his favor, hold it a fashion and a toy in blood, a violent in the youth of primy nature, forward, not permanent. In other words, what's he telling her? Okay, so Hamlet is showing affection. That's the trifling of his favor. He's saying, take that affection as what? Or how's he warning her not to take Hamlet's affection? Is he kind of saying that like guys only want one thing? Yeah. He's saying Hamlet's in the hookup culture. All Hamlet wants to do is hook up. He's not permanent. Okay. She says, no more but so? In other words, really? You don't think Hamlet's serious? You don't think he has honorable intentions? No, he says. For nature, crescent, does not grow alone and fuse in bulk, but as his temple waxes, the inward service of the mind and soul grows wide with all. That is, for, look at your gloss, for nature, where is it? Growing, waxing, for Hamlet's nature growing, as he reaches maturity, he seems to be implying, what's going to happen? The inward service of the mind and soul grows wide with all. He will come to remember what? 
What is now King Charles III? What was Prince Charles preparing for for essentially the last geez, 50 years to be king? Okay. So when he fell in love with Camilla, his current wife, before he met Princess Diana, because they were lovers before then, why didn't he marry her? And she was married because she was already married because the queen said, no, can't happen. Why? Because you're the future king. She's still married. Okay, she could get a divorce. At that point in time, in the late 80s, a future king could not marry a divorcee. Okay? It's one of the reasons Queen Elizabeth was queen because her father became king when his older brother abdicated the throne to marry an American divorcee. So he goes on. Perhaps he loves you now. And now <coughs> no soil nor coddle doth besmirch the virtue of his will. That is, and maybe his will has power to achieve the love that he has for you. Maybe there's, there's nothing negative about it now, okay? But you must fear his greatness, Wade. What's his greatness? He's the future king. His will is not his own. See, one of the things that happened between Prince Charles marrying Diana and Prince William marrying Kate Middleton is the queen kind of had a change of heart. And she told William, you can marry her, even though she was not in any way of, of royal blood. See, Diana Spencer, the family line could be traced back to royalty. Princess Diana. Kate Middleton, pure commoner. Common blood. Yeah, her family's loaded. You could be Bill Gates and no royalty there. No blue blood is the term there. Okay? So, his greatness, Wade, his will is not his own. Remember that word will has multiple meanings. Volition, desire, Sexual desire, sex organs, all those things aren't his own with his greatness way. For he himself is subject to his birth. See, we kind of don't think of princes or kings as being subject to their birth, and yet they are. He may not, as unvalued persons do, carve for himself. That is, choose who's going to be his mate. For on his choice depends the safety and health of his whole state. So he says, here's what Hamlet's all about, um, Ophelia. He says, he just wants to get you into bed. Fear it, Ophelia, fear it, my dear sister, and keep you, this is line 33 or so, keep you in the rear of your affection, out of the shot and danger of desire. Okay? Be wary towards the end of his speech. She says, I will take the tenor of your message to heart. I will follow what you suggest. But don't practice a double standard with me. You do the same. She turns the tables on her brother. Okay? Good, my brother, do not as some ungracious pastors do. Show me the steep and thorny way to heaven wilds like a puffed and reckless libertine. Himself the primrose path of dalliance treads. In other words, don't be like a preacher who says, don't do this and then secretly do it yourself. Okay? Polonius comes in. And Polonius gives Laertes advice. All right? This advice is often taken to be nothing but the prattling on of a busybody old man. Okay? I don't think that's right. Most of the advice that he gives here can be found, for example, in the book of Proverbs. 
slightly restated, some of it, but much of it is very much like Proverbs. What is a proverb? It's a short, pithy piece of wisdom. Okay? So, here are his precepts, okay? That he wants Laertes to, quote unquote, in thy memory, look thou character. Character means to write. So, write these aphorisms in your memory. Inscribe them. Give thy thoughts no tongue, nor any unproportioned thought his act. So, don't say what you're thinking, and don't act out a thought that has not been thought through unproportioned. Okay? Be thou familiar, but by no means vulgar. That is, let people in the community know who you are, etc., but don't wear out your welcome. You've all been at a party, or maybe you've had a party, where you've told people, come on over, you know, this time to this time, and then there's always somebody who has to stick around for like an hour or two hours later. That's what he's getting at. The friends you have in their adoption tribe, that is, and you've proved their friendship, grapple them to thy soul with hoops of steel. Bind those friends. Make those friends your good friends. We don't, I don't, I don't see this kind of friendship very much in our society today. Where I do see it is in the military. When somebody's been through a firefight with, you know, with your buddies, those buddies who have your back, or cops, they're the ones you trust no matter what. Okay? But do not dull thy palm with entertainment of each new hatched, unfledged comrade. That is, don't bother yourself with somebody who, you know, sends you a quote-unquote Facebook friend message and automatically think that person is willing to lay down a life for you. Beware of entrance to a quarrel. Don't get involved in arguments. But... <laughs> Being in, what? Bear it that the opposed may beware of thee. So, do everything you can to not get involved in a fight. But if you get in a fight, do what? Win. Win? Win how? Make sure you have the right friend around. Okay, that. But win in such a way that the person knows never to get involved in a fight with you again. Okay. Give every man thy ear, but few thy voice. Okay, now what is his job again? He's the Lord Chamberlain. He's the right-hand man to the king. He's the king's chief advisor, which means he's supposed to talk a lot to the king. He says, give every man thy ear. Listen to what people have to say to you, but don't tell them what you're thinking. Take each man's censure, but reserve thy judgment. When someone criticizes you, listen to it. Take it, but don't give your judgment. In other words, don't respond. Hey, I don't think you did this so well. Oh, yeah, well, you don't do that. Just listen to it. Costly thy habit as thy purse can buy. In other words, wear what you can afford but don't go into debt to buy something really fancy and gaudy. Why? For the apparel oft proclaims the man. They in France are the best rank and station or the most select and generous chief of that. And he's saying, and I know you're going back off to France, you're going off to Paris, and they wear really nice clothes in Paris. He's saying you don't have to match them, all right? What else? Neither a borrower nor a lender be. So don't borrow money and don't lend money. Why? Because a loan oft loses both itself and friend. So if you loan money to a friend, 
Odds are you're going to lose that money and you're going to lose a friend. And don't borrow money from a friend, odds are, because you're not going to pay it back. And again, you're going to lose a friend. And borrowing dulleth edge of husbandry. Husbandry, hard work. Right? It's a lot easier to borrow money for a car than it is to take a second job, to pay for the car. This above all. So, above everything else I've just told you, to thine own self be true. And it must follow as the night the day, thou canst not then be false to any man. What does that mean, to thine own self be true? Don't lie to yourself. Okay. Stay true to your intentions. Stay true to your intentions. Follow your own compass. You know, there's a a phrase, and I I don't think it's from Hamlet. I'm pretty sure it is in Shakespeare. March to the tune of your own drummer. That is, do what you believe to be right. Don't don't squander your principles to get in tight with somebody else. Okay? Bad advice, good advice. I think everything he has said there, pretty good, solid advice. Okay? So he gives us to his son, and then his son goes off. Then he talks to Ophelia. He says, what were you and Laertes talking about? And she says, Hamlet. And he gave me advice. And he says, why? What goes on with the Lord Hamlet? Line 99. He hath my Lord of late made many tenders of his affection to me. Tenders means he's given indications of his affection. Cards, flowers, poems, things like that. Okay? Affection, you speak like a green girl. Green meaning what? A little girl? Yes, a little girl, inexperienced, naive. Question is, is she? We're not told how old Ophelia is. We are going to be told much later in the play how old Hamlet is. It's going to blow your mind. Because Hamlet seems to be pretty young, okay? She says, he says, do you believe these tenders, as you call them? I do not know, my lord, what I should think. Why not? Did she believe those tenders before she talked to Laertes? I kind of think she did. He says, well, then let me teach you. Think yourself a baby that you have taken these tenders for true pay. Okay? In other words, they're like IOUs, which are not sterling. So, she says, My Lord, he hath importuned me with love in honorable fashion. Aye, fashion you may call it. She says fashion, meaning the means, the way in which he did it. He means fashion like well, like what? Like clothes you can put on and take off. Or, as Hamlet suggested, you can play or pretend. And he hath given countenance to his speech, my Lord, with almost all the holy vows of heaven. Notice, not with all the holy vows of heaven. I will love you, Ophelia, with all my heart, soul, mind, strength, you know, till death do us part, so help me God, but almost all. He says, springs to catch woodcocks. Those are traps, Ophelia. Hamlet is merely buttering you up. He is merely flattering you, saying things that make you think he's being sincere and honest. Okay? Line 120, from this time, lost my place, be somewhat scanter of your maiden presence. Set your entreatments at a higher rate than a command to parley. He's telling her, remove yourself from Hamlet's presence. So up until this time, it sounds like she and Hamlet regularly met. Okay. 
For Lord Hamlet believed so much in him, line 123, that he is young and with a large tether, larger tether, may he walk than may be given you. In few, that is in few words, Ophelia, do not believe his vows, for they are brokers. You've got a gloss down there at the bottom of the page for brokers. Go-betweens, procurers. So what word do we use today for a go-between or a procurer of flesh for somebody else? They're pimps. His words are pimps. To do what? To get her. That's what he's telling her. So, I would not in plain terms from this time forth have you so slander any moment leisure as to give words or talk with the Lord Hamlet. So, he's laying down the law. You are not to see Hamlet. Period. Okay? Scene four. Hamlet and the others appear at the battlements. Okay? And... Hamlet talks about the carousing, the party going on in the castle. And Horatio asks, is it a custom? Hamlet, aye, Mary, is it? But to my mind, though I am native here and to the manor born, it is a custom more honored in the breach than the observance. Okay? This heavy-headed revel east and west makes us traduced and taxed of other nations. In other words, yes, it is a custom, but it's more honored in the breach than in the custom. This party, Hamlet says, would be better if we did it less frequently. Why? Because what do other nations think of them? They're drunkards. And I know that Shakespeare had no idea of the old English poem Beowulf. But the old English poem Beowulf is set in Denmark, the same place this is set. And we have numerous lines that talk about the Danes as being drunkards, just constantly drunk seemingly, right? So Hamlet goes on, um, the ghost comes in. Hamlet speaks line 39, page 1255. Angels and ministers of grace defend us. Now that kind of sounds like, oh God, help us, you know. Be thou a spirit of hot of health or goblin damned. Bring with thee airs from heaven or blasts from hell. Be thy intents wicked to draw one down to hell or charitable to aid one in one's journey to heaven. Thou comest in such a questionable shape that I will speak to thee. I'll call thee Hamlet, king, father, royal Dane. Answer me. So, wherever you come from, heaven or hell, I'm going to speak to you. Answer me. Hamlet's just thrown down the gauntlet. If it's from hell, I'm going to risk my soul. If it's from heaven, I'm going to benefit my soul. Either way, it doesn't matter. So he asks, why are you here? That's the why thy canonized bones, hearst in death, etc., etc. Canonized doesn't mean Hamlet Sr. is literally a saint. Okay? You've got a gloss there, line 46. Buried according to the canons of the church. Of the church. Yeah, that's partially what it means, but it also means he's received the, the rights of the church in the funeral. That body has been blessed that coffin has been blessed before it was put in the ground okay why are you here okay and the ghost does this follow me and Horatio and Marcellus are like don't follow it Hamlet says I'm going to follow it what if it tempts you towards the flood what if it tempts you to kill yourself Hamlet I'm following it okay so, they try to hold Hamlet back. They can't. <clears throat> Hamlet goes off with the ghost. Scene five. Hamlet says, I'm not going any farther. You know, speak. 
Mark me. The ghost finally speaks. Okay, now, what is this and the fact that Marcella saw it and Horatio saw it and Bernardo saw it, what is that telling us about the ghost? It's real. It's real. In the production, the ghost should be visible on the stage. All right? I've seen productions before where the ghost is kind of projected as a shadow. It shouldn't be that way. It ought to be where the people can see it, okay? Or at least some of the people can see it. So, mark me. I will. That is, take note. Listen to me. My hour is almost come when I to sulfurous and tormenting flames must render up myself. Sulfurous and tormenting flames? What does that sound like? Hell. Alas, poor ghost, don't pity me, he says, but listen to what I will unfold. I am bound to hear, so art thou to revenge when thou shalt hear. And there's the indication we have a revenge tragedy. I am thy father's spirit, doomed for a certain term to walk the night and for the day confined to fast in fires. Okay? That is, I am bound in these fires. Till the foul cream, creams, till the foul crimes done in my days of nature are burnt and purged away. Where is he during the day? Nope. Because notice the fires will do what to his crimes? They will purge them away. He's in purgatory. See, if you go to hell, that's it. That's all she wrote. There is no coming out of hell. If you go to heaven, that's it. You're there forever. There's no... According to Catholic doctrine, the medieval Catholic Church and the Renaissance Catholic Church, if you go to purgatory, you're there for a period of time until all of your sins are purged. And then you go up to heaven. That time in purgatory can be a long time. It can be a short time. Okay? But it's not permanent. But that I'm forbidden to tell the secrets of my prison house. I could a tale unfold in slightest word. Would hair up thy soul, blah, 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 blah. So, if thou didst ever thy dear father love, Hamlet, oh God. Why does Hamlet say, oh God? Because he knows something big is about to be revealed. Revenge is foul and most unnatural murder. Unnatural. It goes against nature. Murder. Murder most foul is in the best it is, but this most foul, strange, and unnatural. Why is it unnatural? Because it's a replaying of the first murder. Fratricide. Brother against brother. Okay? Hamlet. Hates me to know it that I with wings as swift as meditation of the thoughts of love may sweep to my revenge. He says, okay, I will. And he tells the story. How did he die? He went to sleep in the orchard. He lay down on a bench. And what happened? A snake bit him. The story was that a snake bit him. Who was the snake? Claudius. His brother Claudius, who poured poison into his ear. Okay? I, that incest with Hamlet. Oh, my prophetic soul, my uncle. Why does Hamlet call his soul prophetic? What's he really mean? I knew it. I knew it. There was something wrong. That incestuous, that adulterate beast with witchcraft of his wit, with traitor's gifts, a wicked wit and gifts that have the power, blah, blah, blah. He won to his shameful lust the will of my most seeming virtuous queen. Notice, she seems most virtuous. Okay? So, what does he command Hamlet to do? Kill your uncle and do what to his mother? Or do what with his mother? That doesn't sound right either. Leave your mother alone. 
He says, leave her to heaven. Heaven will take care of her. Okay? And Hamlet says, when the ghost leaves, his third soliloquy. Oh, all you host, line 92, page 1258. Oh, all you host of heaven, O oh earth, what else? And shall I couple hell? O oh, fie, hold, hold my heart, and you my sinews grow not instant old, but bear me stiffly up. Remember thee? Ah, you poor ghost. And what does Hamlet do? Okay. Before we go on with the rest of that line, hell, we'll stop there because we just ran out of time. We're going to come back. And we're going to pick up line there. It was about line 92. Only a couple pages short of where we need to be. All right, see you on Friday.